caller. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Well-Centered Woman podcast. We have the lovely Miss Katie Mickles here, and I am so excited to have her here with us on today. And so Katie, welcome. Hello, hello. I am also the number one fan of the podcast as shown by my Spotify wrap. <laughs> yes. So, so I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Tanika. You know, you are welcome. Now I'm going to ask a little dumb question. Yes, I need to fix the view on this because I want it to fix the view. Yes, that's what I want. Yes. Um. So Katie Mickles. We attempted to do a podcast interview mm -hmm. with her, um, and this is about for the for the audience who will listen to this later. We attempted to do it back in July. We had technical difficulties, and so much has happened in your life since then. So, mm -hmm. and I'm over here looking at my notes on the monitor here, but you just had a very fresh and recent escapade where you moved from Oklahoma to New York, but even before that, you did like a nine month stint in Granada, Spain. And so in the middle of all of this, what prompted you? And we're gonna get into your background, but we kind of just wanna lay a foundation. What prompted you to move from Oklahoma to New York here recently, like in November? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so originally I was actually planning on moving back to Spain. Um, and I even like had a school placement over there and everything because um, I was an English teacher. And in my heart, I knew that I was doing the thing that was easier for me to do. That was more of like the safe route. But deep down, I knew that I was wanting to move to New York City. Um, I just already had it in my heart. And at the end, of my time in Spain originally I remember telling my friends like I feel like when I get back to the United States it's just going to be when my real life begins like up until now it's been more experimenting and testing and traveling and doing all those things that are amazing for my growth but more temporary because the relationships you know we move they don't necess they aren't necessarily going to be um, long lasting and temporary communities, things that I loved, but I was just feeling like I'm ready for something more permanent and more real for this phase of my life. So I was already deep down feeling that way. Um, and then finally, I blurted out that I wanted to live in New York City um, to my business partner and also the person that um, is help that I build, that we build um, our community together, faith driven business leaders. Um, one day when we were on the phone, I was like, I think I want to move to New York City. And then I kind of like backtracked and like was still trying to go to Spain. And um, I even got to the point where I was hitting by on a plane ticket to Spain. And it was so funny because God it just, you know, God, sometimes he's just like, no. Um, and so the plane ticket purchase like would not go through. And I was just like, okay, fine. So God uh, blocked it. it like yeah, God blocked it. I didn't have peace about it. My mom didn't have peace about it, um, which is always a sure sign. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, so I was like, okay, I know for sure I'm not going to do that. And then started looking for apartments here in the city. And I'm a freelancer right now. And everything was so expensive that finally, I just told God, I said, God, like, my intention is to move to New York City to build this ministry. And it's in my heart. But right now with these apartments, if I go, I'm going to be strapped for cash and it's just not going to be pretty like I'm going to need to have someone co-signing with me on an apartment just things that I don't want to do at this phase of my life mm -hmm. and so I said God just know like my intentions are there to go but I'm going to stop pushing and I'm going to put it on you and if you want to open that door you can open that door but it's your timeline and that's it and so I kind of let it go and was actually even thinking about doing other things, but like still wanted to move to New York City. And then I just remember one day 
I just felt like God was pretty much telling me like, you need to expect a miracle today. Like I watched a sermon where she was just preaching to my soul about like being expectant. And it was all about when it rains, like how that's representative of miracles. And the next day I saw it was going to rain. So I was like expecting a miracle to happen that day. And this isn't an all the time occurrence where I'm like, oh, a miracle today, even though I probably should be expecting like that. So the rain comes and the storm came and I got a text from Edgar about that he found a room for me for $600 a month, which is just insane in Manhattan, like as his neighbor in the area that is like perfect for my age and personality and I didn't even consider Manhattan, which is like the more expensive area, but God, he, he was just, he just, he does it. And so that was the open door. And then I knew that it was God ordained and not just my fleshly desires. So that was my green flag. And I went ahead and just did it. I love it. I love it. You said so much just in that journey right there. When you talked about when you left Spain or what you were feeling that sense that okay I need to get settled I feel Mm -hmm. like I've been kind of floating around experimenting but what I'm hearing is that you wanted to kind of get to a place okay where I settle in and kind of get grounded into more of my purpose I'm kind of done with the experimentation and exploration and Mm -hmm. so but you were still acting like you were going to Spain yeah and then God (laughs) blocked it that's a whole story right there And then you had to set an intention. So it was like letting go of the experimentation and exploration. I'm ready to get rooted Mm -hmm. and grounded and settled. Then you said, okay, I'm going to set this intention and then I'm going to leave it alone and let go. Mm -hmm. Then you began to have expectancy for a miracle. And then the door opened. And I love how you said, this is how I know it wasn't my flesh. (laughs) <laughs> that's a beautiful beautiful story so it's just so much in there now we're going to backtrack a little bit because now i do want yeah. to get into because we're going to circle back to it but we want to get to your backstory and how you arrived at this position because your story wasn't always angel dust and fairy mm-hmm. fairy angel fairy dust and hearts and stars and rainbows Right. No, <laughs> God brought you from alone. You have a really powerful and profound journey. So can you share with with the listeners your spiritual journey, how you came to Christ and how, you know, as brief as you want to or elaborate mm-hmm. how you want to. But you had that um, whole situation where you kind of dabbled around in a variety of different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That point. So share that with us. Yes, a variety of different things. And it's great because now God really is using all of it. Um, and God is so good. But um, yeah, pretty much what my backstory is, is that um, that I came from a time when I was younger and I loved God so much. And he worked a miracle when I was younger, which I I told our group about where I was, he put a dream in my heart to go to boarding school. And it was like the biggest desire I've ever had to this day. It was, I I had a certainty about it and God opened up a door for me to get like a $250,000 scholarship to this boarding school as a and it was insane. So, and I told God, God, if you open that door, I will dedicate my life to teaching people about you and to glorifying you. This is me in middle school, like making these negotiations, but I still remember. Um, but I started to, wow. Become, yeah. I just had to say that because God has held you to that promise. Oh, Even yeah. though you took a long roundabout detours, you are, ooh, baby. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. He knew. He knew. I, love I mean, it. I got a lot of exposure. Let's say that. Like, I'm honestly thankful because I think if I would have just stayed on that path, there's a lot of people I wouldn't be able to relate with and empathize with as much. Um, but I, I went to this boarding school and I just 
<clears throat> it was my first time being around like atheists and people of different religions for the first time ever because I'm from the south and I just remember that I would debate with one of my uh, friends who was an atheist at lunch all the time and I was so gung-ho like God had just worked this miracle but eventually I started to doubt um and I was in a world religions class and just started noticing all these people that were just like me um had different religions that they 100% believed in as much as I did and I just started thinking like who am I to think that I'm right about my faith and I just got, I, I I came into that belief that we're all um, getting at the same thing. All religions are getting at the same thing. And um, Christianity, which is my parents' interpretation that I was born into. And so I started to slip in in that those moments and start my journey of um, experimenting with other religions. And uh, at this time, I'd already started um being really excited to start partying in college like I was so excited and I was already like my god was boys and the hockey players at the high school I went to and being popular and I I like I feel like some things happened to me in high school that really made me harden to the point that I became kind of a a selfish person I would say and and that affected the rest of my journey and I'll just go ahead and say what that those things were because I'm sure people can relate like when I first got there I had a boyfriend who um I trusted and I was a freshman and made the mistake of sending some photos and those photos got around the school and I felt completely humiliated like it's a brand new freshman and the thing about when you're at boarding school is you cannot escape when something like that happens everyone knows and you cannot leave and so I immediately just felt so dirty and the shame the ashamed. enemy uses shame that's a big demon ashamed and I I just remember like a shift that happened to me where I was like I'm gonna get through this like no matter what it costs and I kind of became like I'm gonna own it and I'm just gonna I was like clawing my way to like get back what I had lost and I feel like it made me hard promiscuous and just almost like more strategic in everything I was doing rather than just enjoying life and enjoying friends it's like who is this person gonna help me kind of like get to get good in the eyes of everyone again because I was so humiliated and it was so bad. You became bad. strategic and hardened to to like mm -hmm. in your ego and in your flesh yeah. to get back, to rise to the top, to yeah. sort of be in control of what people thought of you, to get a handle on exactly. that. And it was rooted in shame. Oh, yeah. It was rooted in shame. And mm. um, yeah, it was bad. Like I have a heart for anyone who is like had pictures sent out of them because just to, just to tell you how bad it is, like, there's been times where I was an adult and someone will have, like, met someone from Culver, where I went to high school, who told them about this picture of me and that person will say something to me, like, over, like, six years later. Like, that's how much it got around. Like, it was insane. And it's like it never, it's like it didn't die down. And so I lived with so much shame about that. And, mm. um that's that's yeah. so powerful because it gives you an appreciation yeah it puts you in a unique position for god to use you mm -hmm. i'm thinking for high profile people celebrities mm -hmm. people who have been put to shame on a mass level for things in instagram and social media and now they're in that place of shame so how did you yeah. but that gave an open door to the enemy yeah for bigger things right right 
right? So, um, yeah, so moving on from there, um, yeah, the promiscuity and the partying really just continued through college, and I got into the new age, which for people listening is um, like tarot, psychic stuff, um, Reiki healing, things that deal with um, the demonic, I'll just say it how it is, and um, what's funny though, and why I touched more on the other part of my testimony this time is that I, as I've been going through um, healing and deliverance, I actually was in a deliverance session one time and was just bringing a deliverance minister through my story. And he actually, before I told him I was involved in the new age or anything, dr- guessed from the beginning of my story, because he said it's a pattern in women who have gone through these types of things that are trying to get power back however they can and trying to like regain control so a lot of women who have been through some sexual trauma or sexual abuse will get into the new age as a way to try to just re-get that control that they feel like they lost which I thought was really interesting yes that is power so you were on a journey to get your power back and didn't know it but it opened the door for the demonic and new age presents false source instead of going to God Mm -hmm. as your power source you're dibbling and dabbling going to the devil or satanic Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. and I just remember the biggest reason I wanted to be in the new age and be this healer and be this person that had all the answers because I was just you can get big ego hits when people are getting psychic greetings from you and you got all these answers for them and you're taking the place of God. And, um, I just, I remember I just wanted to seem one clean and pure because, Oh, this girl, she's a healer. Like she must have it all figured out when on the inside, all I felt was just so dirty and broken. And, um, just, I, I just wanted to be able to like, help and connect with people and it's like I was trying to stay a level above people um so that they you know like couldn't hurt me like and I think a lot of people involved in the new age it can give you a sense of pride and you know something other people don't know you're better than other people and when you've been hurt that can make it seem like okay then those people can't hurt me but really it's just a false connection and Mm. lack of real vulnerability so so it's like you kind of have a wall and you're saying that you know you get an ego hit and you kind of try to keep yourself above others Mm -hmm. so to speak because you got this new age it's sort of a alternative spiritual technology yeah it's kind of what it is and you know something different and new that other people don't know and you can use it and you can be accurate even though it's coming from a demonic source it's still accurate it's just Mm -hmm. the source is wrong right 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 and so now you're getting power even though deep down inside you said i feel dirty and broken but i want people to i want to feel pure and clean so in that journey what what would you tell somebody if they're in that place right now where you are Mm. if i was talking to someone who was in that place that i was um I would just say that all of those things, um, you can never do enough yoga or Reiki or um, any of the things that I did to actually become what you're trying to become. Like it's, it's never going to get you there. And um, gosh, Holy Spirit, help me out with this one. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I would just say like that there's one thing that can um, and that that's you're probably not going to believe me. But then I would go into my story and just say I didn't even believe me. But um, like Jesus encountered me when I was in that space and rescued me out of it. And like that's this is what I do feel like telling my story is good and actually letting people know 
you know, it's dead seriousness on my face. Like I have had demonic attacks and all these things from doing what you're doing right now, because I feel like they, they really need to hear like, what's at stake here. <laughs> yeah. So what was the trigger point when you finally said enough is enough? There was a journey. If I remember when we tried mm -hmm. to do it before, where you kind of hit a, a several low points where God was mm -hmm. really trying to be, because you could have lost your life. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, a big part of my experience during that time was, um, rave culture and drug culture. And a lot of that was seen as ways to actually become more enlightened and to improve yourself. So, I've had many, many, many experiences with psychedelics and the parties and everything like that. And, um, which is not a brag. I would not go back to that. Um, and yeah, eventually I reached a point where I was, just at a music festival and I was just so unsatisfied with where my life was. I was traveling around at the time with a business partner who was just not good for me and um, just doing Xanax, which I was addicted to at the time. And was just so empty and depressed that I knew deep down, like I didn't even want to be alive anymore. And I wouldn't be sad if my soul left my body. I just kind of remember thinking that. Mm -hmm. And at this music festival, it's like that actually happened. I took some drugs and had a seizure and just remember it wasn't like when you fall asleep or anything where you're dreaming or something. It's like I was out and I woke back up. No time passed in between. Boop, boop. So I, I kind of think that I died there for a second. Like I was not there. I was not there. You're and right. I wake back up and um, I don't know how I even survived. I don't think I should have, but God luckily had a plan. Mm -hmm. um, but even after that, like I think from that, God was really calling me home because I had this huge desire suddenly to become abstinent and just I was desiring something. I was desiring God. I was so desiring. That's what God. it was. You didn't know what you were desiring, but you were mm -hmm. desiring God. Yes. And I'd known him before. So I knew that feeling. And God's told me that he that he was with me that whole time that I went through like all of these things. He was he never right left. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he told me too that I wasn't unsaved or anything. Like all the things I did, like, because when he gave me that realization, I only felt like the, a true outpouring of the Holy Spirit probably like three or four times. But when I, he gave me that realization that through that whole time, I was never unsaved or anything that the Holy Spirit outpoured on me like crazy. And I was just like, seriously god like you're that good like that good. he didn't leave me the whole time and he didn't he, he didn't, didn't he didn't let me go and I think that was just so special to know that like I did all that all he didn't let me go the redemption yeah the love of god yeah love of god so powerful and so I'm just kind of remembering bits and pieces of when we talked the last time I seen it seems like you said you started Googling and researching and looking oh, at yeah. YouTube. Tell us about kind of <laughs> like, cause I think that was part of it, right? Yeah. So that's the best part of the story. So at this time, um, yeah. Okay. So even after I had this incident at the music festival, um, I found myself in a really like stressful, stressful, stressful job again, feeling so anxious and just thought, I'm just going to do a little bit of Xanax so I can deal and get through this. And 
like what meant to be one day was turning into like two weeks. And I was like realizing I was going down this path again after being sober for about a year. Um, and also had a, um, an old man from my life. I don't even know what to call him because we were never like anything official. And also realized I was starting to get on that path again. And it's like something inside of me. I got a super natural strength. It's the only way I can describe it to quit cold turkey, which is actually dangerous, but something inside me knew like, if I don't quit cold turkey, like I will never be able to quit this. Like I have to just stop. And so I just stopped. And during that time I was just withdrawing in my room because when you quit Xanax, it's, it's horrible, like horrible. You feel like you don't sleep, you don't eat, (laughs) you sweat and it feels like your skin is crawling out of itself. Also, it's like one of the number one prescribed drugs in the United States, by the way. And, um, which is insane to me. And Mm. so I felt, I was feeling all of these things. I had like my tarot cards next to me trying to figure out like, what is going on right now? You were messing with the tarot cards still in the middle of all of this. So, because at the time I didn't even think a thing about it. Like I was still hadn't encountered Jesus yet, but that night one of the nights when I was withdrawing and it was just horrible I just had a friend text me and say like no I had a little what I felt like was an encounter with Jesus um not what I felt like it was and I just remember something coming around me and saying like I love you just as you are like right now and that's like what it was and I felt like it was Jesus meanwhile I'm like withdrawing off drugs tarot cards But Jesus is like that. He's so sweet. Like, that is how he is. Like, he came and was like, that was the first thing he said to me. Like, I love you just as you are right now. And I had a friend text me in that same moment saying she had just had a dream about Jesus. And I was like, okay, like, this is weird. Like, I just had like a little Jesus moment. You just saw Jesus. And wow. Mind you, at the time, like, I wasn't even necessarily thinking of, like, oh, this is the Jesus of the Bible. I just thought, I don't know what I was thinking, but my brain didn't think that way back then. And so I just remember I I started doing research of, like, the truth about Jesus. I remember typing that in. I was in my bathtub and finding a video of this girl who had done, who it was titled From New Age to Jesus and felt inclined to click on it. And I saw, I saw that I'd watched half of the video before, but I guess it wasn't clicking at the time. And I was just like, no. And so I watched it again and um, it scared me because this girl, she's crying. She's like, guys, you're not going to believe me. Like, I promise you, like, I wouldn't have believed me four days ago, but like, I got into all this stuff and like, like I like but Jesus is real and like she was so scared because it's absolutely horrifying when you if you were in the new age before and you realize Jesus is real it's so scary because you just opened up a bunch of doors so it's very very terrifying um and so she's so scared and I'm just something in my spirit's resonating that like oh she's not lying like this girl is telling the truth and I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Because I just started realizing like what I'd been doing and what was going on. And so I started getting really scared. I start watching all these other YouTube videos and they're all the same. These people are so scared. A lot of them even omit the details of like what happened after because they don't want to give the enemy any power to like scare people even more. Mm. Um, so they'll they say like, I won't even say like what exactly happened after, but basically I'm good now and we'll just tell their stories and their testimonies and, oh man, it's just, it's just wild. Like the, the, the things that you see. And, um, so finally I, I started realizing like, oh my gosh, like, I think this is so real. So I'm freaking out. 
And I'm so scared. I have no Christians in my life other than my parents. And so I just remember I'm like in the park after mind you, I'm still like withdrawing. And so I'm like really freaking out and like because of that too. And so I'm in this park and I'm just like, what do I do? What do I do? Like, uh, just I'll just think nothing. Then they can't like hurt, like nothing could hurt me. And like, I'm just going to just, I'm just going to take a break from it all for a while. But I remember it was just too late. Like the wheels were already turning and everything was already happening. And then the next night came and I had um, a dream where I just know I, I was in a huge room and it was green and regal and God was there on his throne. And I just remember Jesus was on his hands and knees um, in front of me. And it was, it was the most intense situation. It was the judge, it was judgment that was happening. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was like on his hands and knees, like, and it, it was very serious. Like he's really getting the review of my sins and I'm just standing behind him can move around all good. Nothing's happening to me. And then I just heard in the dream, like, can't you tell that the end times are near, which is insane. <laughs> like that's something wow. the Holy Spirit would say, you know, because <laughs> at the time I wouldn't even have the brains to think like you didn't end know. times are near. Yeah, I know. So I wake up and I repent and I accept that Jesus is real and I got the outpouring of the Holy Spirit like I'd never felt before. And it just felt like pure love just like surrounding me. And that was it. I was a Christian. That and was it. You got saved from a dream. Yeah, from a dream. Through a dream and the outpouring mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit through a dream. And he said, it's the end times. Yeah, he specifically warned me. Like that, it's, it's interesting that's the first, one of the first things that God ever said to me was that the end times are near and I think as Christians we don't it's very it's an uncomfortable thought for me I'll be honest <laughs> like because it makes me feel like I like urgent time is of the essence but yeah when I first got saved I really was pushing like my friends texting 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 like guys like Jesus is real like Christianity is real and stuff and I remember people kind of being like they were poo-pooing it right diminishing it or world blowing it off yeah so, yeah what do you feel like your role is i mean god used to dream to snatch you from out of the pits of darkness you were into row new age you were living a prompt yeah. promiscuous life you were addicted to xanax traveling all over the world <laughs> opened up this whole door to your life to the enemy and then to mm -hmm. come in and be saved by a dream from mm -hmm. googling off youtube what do you think it speaks to your role in the kingdom? What is God saying to you? Oh man, I I think it honestly like it still intimidates me like what my role is because I see myself um I just see myself like being a representative of like what God can do and like having like extreme faith and like being a convicted pastor. Cause you know how you can tell like different, pa different pastors are, there's some pastors when they speak, it's like God has just convicted them in a good way. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm one of those pastors, like in my heart, I feel like I am. Um, and I see myself doing that and being that and, just bringing like the Holy Spirit and that moment of, oh, she's telling the truth into rooms. Um, and I always, God always gives me a vision too of like me just like kind of getting down on, crouching on the ground next to people and just getting down on their level and just like being with them where they are where whatever that is um because I can kind of no I, I can't relate to everyone's story by any means but I definitely can 
get right there and just say like hey I feel you and I just love that story in the bible that God just brought back to me about the woman who uh, what I don't even remember exactly how it was but she sinned a lot and Jesus will. forgave I her it, it's it's it was the part where or Jesus did. said like who is it's gonna love more scene. oh yeah the person who has a bigger debt that got forgiven or the person who has like a smaller debt who got forgiven yes. and the person says oh the one who has a bigger debt that got forgiven so I really try to remember that my past is an opportunity that I actually get to love God deeper because he did he forgave such a big um debt of mine that it's it's not even he's of course gonna find a way to make it good like now I get to love him even more so that's a really special story to me when it comes to just grappling with everything (laughs) so so good it's been in your story your past your testimony makes Mm -hmm. you so relatable for those that have been in your spot that that have been in that that's why you can come along beside them and I find it very interesting that you feel that you have that that pastoral grace you have even more than that (laughs) you have more than that Mm -hmm. Mm. so one of my questions is just in this journey what do you find to be the hardest part Mm -hmm. about just this whole like deliverance has been ongoing it didn't all happen even though you got saved by the holy spirit in a dream Mm -hmm. that ongoing can you tell us about that what was the hardest part of afterwards yeah um so funny enough the getting delivered from the new age and quitting all that was the easiest part but i would say the hardest part has been laying my life all the way down and really surrendering to God's will for my life. Um, Because what's funny enough is like, those aren't the idols that were hard, the hardest for me to let go of Um, things like having the approval of man and society and um living an unquote nor quote unquote normal life and just kind of not wanting to take up a lot of space that would be required to actually walk out my calling. This is just what I'm struggling with right now, if I'm being honest. Oh, um, that's so good. We don't yeah. want to take up space. And you're that's right. What it like. That's laying down our proclivity to people, please, as women of faith, as women of God. Mm-hmm. You're really surrendering. And then with that surrender comes, now I have to give myself permission. God has already given you permission. He's already given yeah. me permission. But we got to give ourselves permission to take up space, to yeah. be big, to be yes. seen, to be visible. But we want to shrink back. Yes. And that's. Yeah, it's so in my awareness right now. Like I know, you know, when you know what you're doing, and it's you know it, that probably means you're about to go through it. But I'm I'm actually feeling experiencing a physical manifestation of it because right now I've just moved into this room in my apartment. And I'm sharing this apartment with other people, and it just feels like my space is so tight, and I'm trying to do all these things so I don't like disturb anyone, and I. I'm just feeling it like in my physical reality to like hey, you're constricted. Why are you scared to make a noise and wake someone up and why are you nervous to, like just go use the kitchen like it's just it, it's coming into my awareness how scared I am to take up space um mm. And it, I just feel like, oh, when I release my testimony and stuff, I'm going to lose my clients as if God wouldn't like straight up provide for me so much more. But it just always feels like when I take that step, like I'm going to lose it all. Honey, I know the feeling. Um, like if I take this step, what are they going to think? If I, I take I this step they are. and they <laughs> see my video and they see my Instagram posts and they see this podcast on YouTube and see it. <laughs> 
all of a sudden they're going to look at you sideways. Mm -hmm. But then we have to remember who is our source mm -hmm. and who sustained you in, in the middle of all of that. Yeah. He said he was right there with you mm -hmm. at your lowest. And he's still with you now. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it is hard because I want to lay it down and to not, to feel like I almost can't. And when I really want to so bad and just like knowing how good God is and how much many people need to know him, it's, it's been causing me so much grief, just knowing like, I want to so bad God. And I just feel like I can there's almost really like a disconnect from him that I think is in my own mind because of it. So, so like you want to serve God in a bigger way, but feel like you can't, you feel constricted. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. Cause that was going to lead into my next, one of my next question, what mindset or mentality that, that you have or that God is helping you to release in 22 that you can't take into 2023. Mm -hmm. What is it this or is it something else? Oh man, it's gotta be this. It has to be this. Um, Cause I know I'm stepping into like a new woman. Um, I've committed to working with a life coach for six months, which is, a big commitment for me and I'm, I'm going through uh, life coaching training and just, I'm taking the steps to get the community around me to help me to get through and out of what I'm feeling right now. Um, Cause I, I refuse to stay there. You know, I, I'm going to get through it and get to sharing my story and helping women and writing and just sharing all the good things that God is doing in my life. So I I'm already working on leaving these things behind and God's bringing me the people and all the things. So yeah, he's doing it. And not to mention that you're leading and managing and building a faith-based community. So I'm trying to understand, better understand this disconnect. You feel like on one hand, you're shrinking and constricted and you can't fully take up space. But on one hand, in FDBL, in the Faith Driven Business Leaders Group, you're taking up plenty of space, Miss Ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I do need to give myself a little You need to give yourself credit. So let me ask you this when it comes to that, because remember we're, um, the audience that will hear this, they could be in the same place. What... What is one thing in terms of pursuing and establishing a faith-based community that you didn't expect in the journey of building with FDBL and being in this journey? And what advice would you give to somebody, somebody like you that has a powerful testimony, mm -hmm. crazy faith, has you know, been brought from the edge of darkness and now you're in this place. Okay, I want to be settled in my purpose. Yeah. And I want to build a community and I want to help at this end times harvest so the question is, in building a community like this, what has, you know, what's one thing that you didn't expect and what advice would you give someone? I know, I know immediately. <laughs> I would say, don't let your community become, in your ministry, become your God. I would say that has mm. been easily. Say that again, say it again so I can hush. <laughs> And so I get a good oh. <laughs> don't let your community and your ministry become your God. Um, that's something that I've been having to work through because I found before when I was spending so much time with God and had this very, it's me and you, God, like, it's us too. And we're doing this thing. And it's kind of like said it like things started to shift. And I got busier working for God. Um, but just not hanging out with him so much anymore and feeling like almost starting to feel like what was what's going on in the ministry, like what whatever direction I need to take for, to bring that forward would impact me more than if I was 
to was to hear God's voice, which was like a scary place for me to feel like I was in. And so figuring out how to put God first and number one and yield to him and not my ministry, I'd say is has been a learning, a learning curve. I'm curious if you could relate to that at all or have ever been through that. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely know what you're talking about. I feel like back in the day when I wrote my first book during that wilderness season experience before I actually even wrote the book, but it was the period right before when it was just me, God and my boys Mm -hmm. and they were young at the time and I was in a dead end relationship. And during that time, my dreams are really, you know, I have the gift of, you know, dream prophetically similar as you But back in those days, I, I didn't have anything. It was just a job and my boys and being stuck in a dead end relationship. I really wasn't in a church family. So what did I do? I just studied and prayed and cried to God because I wanted to get married and I wanted this relationship to move. That's when the dreams are really, really clear. And I would care hear really, really strong. And when I wrote the book that after I got out of it and God delivered me, then I wrote the book and then I started getting busy. Mm, yes. And then it was more noise in my life. Even though I'm doing a good thing, the noise and the distraction of the good thing became mm-hmm. louder than the voice of God. Yes, that's it. You said it right there. And I'm still learning. Because I got mm-hmm. even more on me now. This is a big deal. So what we're saying is in response to that question, in building community and building our ministry, we still have to remember our first love. Yes, yes. That that's something my coach has been working with me on a ton is um having that intimate relationship with Jesus and remembering it's a it's a marriage and that that is the most important thing. Um yeah. Because there's the, the world is going to tell you that your achievements and everything are the most important but the truth is you can just go to a job every day and be serving and just living whatever life and if you have a strong relationship with Jesus I I would say good for you and like you are winning in my book (laughs) because amen I know for me when sometimes I'm I'm doing well in the eyes of the world, but my relationship with Jesus is taking a back seat and I don't feel good. And I know deep down that I'm not doing what I was made to do. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. You get to that place where it's gotta be more than this. Mm-hmm. And the work is, is empty. <laughs> yeah. It's gotta be more than that. So like what I mentioned, you know, in getting you back here on the podcast, mm-hmm. as we come into 2023, we're letting go of, you said you were letting go of that disconnect, like feeling like you're too constricted to really step into the fullness of what God is calling you to, yeah. that you're, you're working and struggling in that. But what would you say would be your edge? Mm. Uh, business like what's your competitive edge what's your edge what's your edge what is mm-hmm. your edge that God is yeah. heading into 23 um yeah I feel like I, I thought about this question a lot um I feel like my edge is that I am like the best way I can describe it, it's a weird way to describe it, it's like razor sharp and can be focused on what I'm building. And I'm so, I can be so like adaptable and move. And it's like the whole taking, not taking up a lot of space thing can actually turn into a positive in some ways when you're being entrepreneurial because um, it's like, oh wait, I can live on $500 and like, um I'm gonna push and like see this thing through so I think while we're building here in New York just the tenacity that God has built in me because of my background and because of my story and just the things that I have just 
gotten through and the times when I had to push and push to get through them, like just working with a really like insane business partner and just all these things that I've gotten through, it makes me now, it makes working with the person I work with now a dr- absolute dream and just my ability to deal with the problems and the adversity as they came up um, is, I would say, what my competitive edge is. <laughs> so your competitive edge, so to speak, we, let's not say competitive, we're going to say your kingdom edge. Mm-hmm. My kingdom Katie edge. Mickles, Katie Mickles' kingdom edge going into 23. It's tenacity mm-hmm. and focus. And what I'm hearing mm-hmm. is because of what you've been through, even though you have you were dabbling around and you were far mm-hmm. away from God and you were out here getting power from another source that was not godly and you were in these pits and in the all of that stuff. While you're doing those jobs, you develop skill sets and a certain tenacity mm-hmm. and a work ethic that you yeah. are bringing now as you're building the kingdom. Right. That's giving yes. you a certain capacity. You have a deeper capacity for focus and you're mm-hmm. more agile. And deeper capacity to... for pain. <laughs> well, say now let's 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 and go I'm into sorry. that. What are you talking about? <laughs> you have a capacity. Well, I, I think anytime anytime you're building something, um I think from the ground up uh it's painful I guess this is my opinion like things are gonna happen people are gonna leave things are gonna be said um and just all these things that make you want to quit and I think to just be able to say like no like it's fine we're gonna keep going like that is the capacity the capacity the pain capacity (laughs) so you're saying we want to write this down because you're going to listen to this Your capacity, your kingdom edge going into 23 is your tenacity, (laughs) agility, ability to pivot, and your pain tolerance. You have a high Mm -hmm. threshold. So it's the power. There's a book where I hear my pastor say it, the power of the stay. Mm -hmm. Stay in power. Right? Yeah. Things look dull and stagnant, and when when it's just down and dry, you're going to stay right yeah and I think I've been anointed to do that for a while like work with someone and build something um beautiful but it just I was getting linked up with the wrong people in the past like the wrong entrepreneurs and stuff um but now it feels like okay this is like a good person that I'm working with that has integrity it's like we're like submitted to God and so this time it feels right so it feels like I'm in heaven in comparison Um, so that builder's anointing that you had it was on you already but it was on the wrong side of it yeah I'm just working with the wrong people and also I thought of what I'm leaving behind in 2023 22 uh, or 2022 yeah let me not get ahead of myself and it's something that my coach helped me realize and that's that I've been in survival mode um for so long and what that looked like was um because of who my business partner was in the past he was so chaotic and we'd be getting on planes every day like missing meetings I never knew what the next day was going to hold so I would never plan anything would just always be dealing with whatever day is ahead of me like one day at a time it's the only way I know how to do it. And now that I'm moving into a more secure place in my You're life. Grounded and settling. It serves me to plan ahead and look into the future and um, cast a vision for my life. And I haven't really been doing that. I've been doing things just still day to day, questioning is everything going to work out? And I think it's more than just my last business partner with, but just being in that survival mode just trying to get through just one day at a time and yeah just getting through getting out of that and actually being like I'm secure in my life now like I can trust God to provide I can I can actually look at the week ahead and maybe like you know plan a little bit and 
it's a it's a transition that's honestly been a little bit difficult but I'm just I want to get out of survival mode to get out of survival mode and to get Mm -hmm. into thriving mode to get into a mode where you can look ahead and you're not just living your life one day out. You I'm only can think about one day. I can't think two days. I right. can't think 48 hours in advance. Let me just make it through the day, God. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so if you've been living in, may I ask you, how old are you, Katie? 28. We lamb, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you're saying you've been living in survival mode probably mm-hmm. for the last, what, 10 years or so? Eight yeah. Eight years, right? Yeah, feels like since I've been, like, been on my own, which I went to boarding school, so like 14. Um, so yeah, and I think a lot of people are living in survival mode too. It's kind of like a a trauma response, but I am ready to move into thriving mode and have life goals and my finances in order and my clients taking care of and just get the groundwork, the foundation more solid. So you're in, that's a what we're great, on now. you're in a great place to do that. And I know very well what you're talking about being a single divorced mom mm. and not realizing that you're in trauma when you're in survival, you know, that survival. Mm-hmm. And I, that was a real mindset transition. Like Tanika, you're not the struggling single mom anymore. Yeah. You made it. You made it. <laughs> These boys are fun. <laughs> Like and you, you feel like you got out of and like, I'm still like mode. um in some ways yeah and in some ways I feel like some of it is still there yeah I feel like in terms of overall life like I'm still working in corporate America but when it comes to my platform I feel like there's still some of that survival because I haven't you know it's a whole you know my story <laughs> you've mm-hmm. been in that clubhouse room <laughs> But um, story. yeah, yeah. So as we close this up, and I think I've asked you this question before, but what is your plan? This is going to be my closing question. And then we're going to ask, let, give, you, give you a chance to share with people how they can connect with you. What is your plan yeah. to be intentional, to renew your mind and keep this edge, to keep this tenacity to stay out of survival mode, Mm -hmm. to not allow feeling constricted and cause you to shrink back and not take up space. Those are the things that you're kind of dealing with when triggers come. Yeah. When triggers come, come, when you don't feel motivated, when you feel discombobulated, when you're upset, someone did something, said something or didn't do something or something jumps off. Like, what are you going to do to stay on your square? In 23. Yeah. Keep this edge. You gotta mm-hmm. keep this kingdom edge, right? Uh, my plan is to have a plan in general. And um I I'm trying to build slowly but surely, but just like look towards the, the week ahead. And then the biggest thing for me to do this year is to keep Jesus on the throne and stay focused on that and because when I'm focused on that it's like nothing can really throw me off because I'm reminded why am I doing this like is it to get attention from a boy or is it because I need to lead people to Christ and when I remember I'm like oh I remember now and I'm like okay then I can just let all of that those things go and I can focus and oh that doesn't matter because this is what I'm focused on and oh I have you Jesus like you if as long as I have you I'm okay so that's like the biggest thing for me this year that is my my weapon and my superpower (laughs) and yours too (laughs) amen that's right that's our focus so you touched on something the motives of the heart because when it gets hard and we lose our motivation, then it's like time to do that heart check. Like, what are you doing? Are you trying to get some attention from somewhere? Are you trying to people please? Are you worried about yeah. what people think? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's, That's what you're going to do. Keep Jesus the main thing. Yeah. And feel triggered up and remember your why. Lord, help me. <laughs> like, remember your why. It's in times. He called yeah. you 
for such a time as this. He snatched you out of the pits mm -hmm. of new age yeah. for such a time as this. You were built to be a builder. Your blueprint mm -hmm. is a kingdom builder, and that's what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm so proud. So good. So how can people connect with you? What do you have going on? What do you want people to know about you that <laughs> they may want to follow you, whatever? Yeah. So you can connect with me at Katie Michaels on Instagram. And if you are listening to this and you're in New York City or even online, definitely connect with the community that uh, I'm a big part of building, which is faith-driven business leaders. So we're FDBL official on Instagram. And we're about to go through a big rebrand and our whole thing is we're just helping build leaders outside of the four walls of the church by talking about and teaching things that we might not touch on within the church and um so if you feel like that applies to you uh, and you're listening to this and you just want to have those types of conversations and connections definitely reach out to me and i'd love to tell you some more and otherwise i'm about to get my life coaching certification and would love to just help girls who maybe feel like they have gone through something similar and just need someone that can relate and um, hear them and just remind them about who, you know, Jesus says they are and the potential that they have in them. Um, that's probably going to get started around July when I can actually take in clients. So um you can definitely connect with me ahead of time and would love to work with you. So that's what's going on with me. Awesome. Awesome. So we would definitely have her contact information in the show notes where you can follow her on Instagram. We'll also have the contact information for the faith driven business leaders, all of their connect con contact information <laughs> will be there and definitely follow Katie. If you've been in that place where You've dabbled in new age. You've been in darkness. You've been far from God. Connect with her so that when she opens up her coaching, you can, can connect with her and mm -hmm. sit in under her and listen to her story and go deeper with her. So definitely we will have that information available. And until next time, thank you so much, Katie, for being here, for sharing your testimony. So powerful and so much wisdom and grace. So I can't wait to see what God is going to do in you and through you. Thanks, Tanika. It's been such a pleasure. You are welcome. You're welcome. We will come back and talk to you all later. <laughs>